Here's an overview of the fundamental types of crystalline solids. Um, crystalline solids, there's molecular, ionic, and atomic solids. Molecular solids um, have components that are molecules. These are going to have generally low melting points because what holds molecules together? Is it bonds? No, it's those intermolecular forces. And even the strongest intermolecular forces are much weaker than bonds. And so molecular solids tend to melt at low temperatures and boil at low temperatures. If the units in the structure are ions, then we call that an ionic solid. Ionic solids are held together by ionic bonds, which are very, very strong. In essence, any crystal of an ionic compound is one giant molecule. We don't, we don't think of molecules for ionic compounds, but if we did, it would be whatever the whole thing is, the whole chunk. And so they're going to have high melting points because all those ions are held together very strongly. If the components of the solid are atoms, then we have atomic solids. And there are three different categories of atomic solids, non-bonding, metallic, and network covalent. In non-bonding atomic solids, the atoms are just held together by dispersion forces. An atom cannot be polar, so you can't have um, dipole-dipole forces or hydrogen bonds. You can only have dispersion forces, the weakest form. So when we get these atoms held together by dispersion forces, we're going to have very low melting points. Um, metallic solids are held together by metallic bonds. And the melting points of metals vary. Mercury is a liquid at room temperature. Um, and then things like tungsten have extremely high melting points, and there's a variety of melting points in between. Gallium is kind of cool because it's a solid at room temperature, but it melts at body temperature. So if you hold a piece of gallium in your hand, that's enough heat to melt it. It'll just melt in your hand, almost like chocolate, but don't eat it. Um, network covalent solids. These are atoms that are held together by covalent bonds. Um, these are going to have, <coughs> excuse me, these are going to have very high melting points because covalent bonds are also very strong. So a diamond is actually a network covalent solid. It's carbon atoms, but they are bonded three-dimensionally to other carbon atoms by covalent bonds. And that makes um, diamonds very strong. Yes? That's a really good question. Um, quartz is silicon dioxide, um, which is a molecule, and yet this is listed as an example of a network covalent atomic solid. I think that's because you don't have discrete molecules of silicon dioxide. The silicon and the oxygens are covalently bonded to each other throughout the substance. So, um, I guess you could think of it as an atomic solid where you have two different kinds of atoms, but they're actually bonded to each other as opposed to being molecules. Does that make sense? Kind of. I think we've got a description of that. Um, so here's all what I said already um, in a little more detail. Molecular solids, um, examples are ice and dry ice where we have discrete molecules held together by intermolecular forces. Ionic solids, such as uh, table salt, calcium fluoride, they're held together by coulombic interactions, the attraction between positive and negative charges of the ions. They have high melting points. Um, the coordination number uh, represents the number of close cation-anion interactions, which lowers the potential energy. So the coordination number is going to be different for the different types of packing. Um, the different crystal structures, structures are going to balance coordination number, charge neutrality, and different ion sizes. And so as you can imagine, this whole concept of how the, these spheres are packed together becomes much more complicated when you introduce 
charge and size differences. Thankfully, we don't have to talk about that. Well, not much anyway. In this example of cesium chloride, uh, chloride and cesium ions are similar in size. And so this can pack, um, let's see, simple cubic coordination number of eight. And calcium sulfide has the same structure. This can happen only when you have similarly sized atoms. I'm sorry, similarly sized ions. And you have to have a charge balance as well. If the ions are different in size, such as sodium chloride, where the sodium ions, where's my pointer? Sodium ions are very small compared to the large chloride ions. Um, the, the packing is limited um, because we have to have charge neutrality. We can't just throw in a whole bunch of little tiny sodium atoms to fill in the spaces. It has to be a one-to-one -one ratio of sodium to chloride. Um, you can actually get sodium chloride in different um, types of unit cells. Uh, rock salt is the face-centered cubic in which the, uh, the sodium ions are in between with the chloride ions on the faces. And so this is an example of the structure of rock salt. When we get even larger ion size differences, such as zinc blend, which is zinc sulfide, um, this arranges with the sulfide ions on, in a face-centered cubic structure, and the zinc ions are in half of the tetrahedral holes formed by these sulfide ions. And what do we mean by a tetrahedral hole? It means the hole formed between four sulfide ions that are arranged in a tetrahedral shape. But only half the holes are going to have zinc because the charge of the zinc and the sulfide are the same. If we have unequal charges, um, fluorite is calcium fluoride. So the calcium ions are face-centered cubic and the fluoride ions are in all eight of the tetrahedral holes because we need twice as many fluoride ions as we have calcium ions. There's also an antifluorite structure which has a different arrangement of the ions. Atomic solids have atoms uh, non-bonding. We've got weak dispersion forces holding them together. They're going to arrange themselves um, using closest pack structures so that they maximize the co coordination number and minimize distance between. Um, the only examples of non-bonding atomic solids are the noble gases in their solid form. Um, all the noble gases are gases at room temperature, hence the name noble gases. Um, you have to get them very, very cold to get them to solidify. And that's because the forces that are holding them together in the solid are so extremely weak, which is dispersion forces. Metallic solids, these also um, take on closest pack structures. They're going to vary in their melting points um, based on the bond strengths between the, the different atoms. Network covalent. Um, so here we have the, the individual atoms being covalently bonded to each other. Carbon actually forms a couple of different types of network covalent solids. One of them is diamond, another is graphite. Both of them are familiar to us. In a diamond, the covalent bonds um, occur in three dimensions. In graphite, we have layers two-dimensional layers of, of graphite. Between the layers are just intermolecular forces, dispersion forces. This is why graphite is slippery, because the layers will slide easily. So essentially, a diamond is one giant molecule. These atoms cannot take on closest pack structures, 
because they are limited by the geometry of the covalent bonds. Carbon can form four covalent bonds. And that's going to take on a tetrahedral structure, and so that's going to cause the structure to be more open than if you just had um, like metal atoms or ions that could take on um, a closer structure. Silicates. So here's your question. These are actually the most common network covalent atomic solids. They have high melting points. Common glass is an amorphous form, not a crystalline form. What we have is we have silicon atoms and oxygen atoms. And rather than being discrete molecules that are held together by dispersion forces or um, dipole-dipole forces, here we have silicon bonded to oxygen, which is bonded to another silicon, bonded to another oxygen, to another silicon. And so it is held together by covalent bonds throughout the structure. It's just that there's two different types of atoms in the structure. <coughs> so any questions? <coughs> 